Hello! Welcome to Experiments and Causation. Let's begin on an historical note. Here's a picture of Wilhelm Wundt in the Experimental Psychology Laboratory at the University of Leipzig in Germany. 1879 is when this laboratory was established, and it is typically taken to be the start of modern psychology. Experiments play a very important role in modern psychology because, in principle, experiments can determine cause and effect relationships. This contrasts with an earlier video where we noted that observational methods cannot determine cause and effect relationships. So we can ask about the characteristics that experiments possess that allow them to draw cause and effect inferences. Here are some characteristics. We'll start out with three of them that typify experiments. First, we typically have a directly manipulated independent variable, and this is something we don't often see in observational studies. Second, experiments typically have control groups or at least control conditions. In fact, experiments that have high levels of control are better at establishing cause and effect relationships. Third, and perhaps most importantly, we have random assignment to groups or conditions. This is something that is very often missing in observational research. Interestingly, there is a type of research design that is known as a quasi-experiment. A quasi-experiment might have a directly manipulated independent variable, and it might also have different kinds of groups, and we can arbitrarily assign one of those groups the status of being a control group. But a quasi-experimental design typically does not have random assignment. And because it's lacking random assignment, it does put a limit on the extent to which we can draw an inference about cause and effect. So here's a trio of characteristics that make experiments experiments. Let's also consider now another trio that helps us draw causal inferences. There are typically three conditions that must be met to conclude something caused something else. The first is counterintuitive to a lot of students, and this is correlation. Now, correlation is counterintuitive to a lot of students because they learn in psychology that correlation does not imply causation. And that's a true statement. Correlation does not imply causation. However, correlation is necessary for causation. It's not sufficient, but it is necessary. And some students have difficulty appreciating that distinction. We would have to at least establish that a correlation is true before we could go on to show a causal relationship. But in addition to having correlation, we need to meet two other criteria. One of those is the time-order relationship. Causes precede effects. Sometimes we can find a correlation between variables, but maybe it's not entirely clear which of those variables occurred first. And absent a well-specified time-order relationship, we have difficulty drawing a causal inference. The third criterion is the elimination of plausible alternative explanations. An important feature of this criterion is that the researcher is only required to eliminate plausible alternatives, not all possible alternatives. Of course, there's room for debate here. What some peer reviewers might find as plausible, other peer reviewers would not find as plausible. But nevertheless, it is the case that experimenters should engage in trying to anticipate alternative explanations for their findings. And one of the benefits of the peer review process is that a peer reviewer might be able to generate a plausible alternative that an experimenter didn't originally conceive. And because of that, the peer review process is very important to science. So to sum up, we have correlation, time-order relationship, and the elimination of plausible alternatives as three criteria that are typically deemed necessary for drawing a causal inference. A well-designed experiment can eliminate a so-called demand characteristic, and this is an important topic within psychology. Demand characteristics are cues that suggest how a participant should behave. One of the ways that researchers can control for demand characteristics is by using a placebo condition. That's a condition containing no active ingredient or manipulation, and this can be used to eliminate the demand characteristics. So for example, if you are in a study and you're receiving a placebo, you might not know it. You can't be sure whether the pill that you're taking, for example, might be an active pill or it might instead just be a simple sugar pill. Either way, you've known that you've taken a pill and the act of taking a pill might change your behavior, but this would be a behavioral change that's occurring both in the placebo condition and also in the active drug condition. In recent years, there's been an important push to alter our traditional placebo conditions into what we now call active placebos. 
active placebos produce noticeable side effects. Let's take an example. Let's say that we're interested in a drug that is psychoactive, but also induces dizziness. If all of a sudden you've taken this drug and you become dizzy, you would begin to figure out right away that you were in the experimental condition and not in the standard placebo condition, and that in and of itself might affect behavior. So one way to control for that is to have active placebos. These might be pills that contain something that induces dizziness without also inducing the psychoactive effect of interest. So the active placebos give us a slightly better hedge against demand characteristics. We can go one step further in so-called double-blind studies. These occur when neither the participants nor the data collectors know who is in which condition. And this helps to minimize not only the demand characteristics, which is what we can minimize using either a standard placebo or an active placebo, but also the researcher bias. That is, it might be the case that researchers otherwise would know that they had administered to one particular participant an active drug and to another one an active placebo, and the researcher might interpret their behavior differently based on the researcher's own knowledge about who is in which condition. So we can control for researcher bias by having a double-blind study. Let's now turn to different kinds of experimental designs. There are two broad categories of experimental designs, the first of which is called a between-subject experiment. We also call this a independent group design or an independent subject design. We use all of those terms synonymously. In any case, this is a condition in which each participant receives only one level of the independent variable. Let's take an example. A participant might receive either the drug or the placebo, but not both. It's one or the other. We can contrast this with the other major type of research design, which would be a within-subject experiment, sometimes also called a repeated measures experiment or a repeated measures design. Here, each participant receives all levels of the independent variable. Staying with our earlier example, a participant receives the drug at one time and a placebo at another time. Now, of course, once we do that, we have to take certain precautions. Specifically, we need to prevent any effect that merely arises from the sequence of conditions. We would call this an order effect. So if we do choose to run a repeated measures experiment, also called a within-subject experiment, we might take our sample and divide it in half. Still, everybody will receive the drug at one time and the placebo at another time, but half of the participants might receive the drug first and the placebo second, and the remaining participants would receive the complementary sequence. Thanks for listening.